Well, hey, what's up, Mission? Uh, if we haven't met before, my name is Taylor, and I don't know if you're like me, um, but in this season, it feels like I have watched just about every single movie that has ever been made. Is anybody else with me? I mean, if it's on Netflix, I've watched it. If it's on Disney+, Plus, I've seen it. If it's on HBO Max, I've watched it. Uh, my wife and I, we just watched Die Hard 1 and 2 for the very first time, and I got to say, um, Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. Um, I don't know what the whole debate is about, but it is definitely not a Christmas movie, and I don't know what some of your favorite movies are, uh, but growing up, one of my favorite movies of all time uh, was the movie The Lion King, and I mean like the original animated version. I mean, my dad's favorite phrase was Akuna Matata. He said that my entire life. Uh, and my favorite trilogy growing up, and still my favorite trilogy to this day, the best trilogy of all time has got to be Toy Story 1, 2, and 3. I mean, growing up, my room was painted blue, and I had like clouds all over the walls, and I had uh, my like woody bedspread on it. Um, and I know what you're thinking. What about Toy Story 4? Well, that was one too many, so I'm just saying that one doesn't count. Um, but then my sister, man, her favorite movie growing up, like if it was on TV, like if it was showing on cable, like it was on our TV, we watched it all the time. And luckily I learned a lot from this movie. I learned about like football and history. I learned about war stories and what it means to like love your country. Um, I learned about um, 27 different kinds of shrimp, like jumbo shrimp, sweet and sour shrimp, coconut shrimp. Um, you know, it made me want to get up and like run across America and run, forest run, that's right, the movie Forrest Gump. And I learned a lot of good life lessons from Forrest Gump. Um, you know, like stupid is as stupid does. Or uh, how about life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Um, and I learned that the best way whenever you're telling a story, writing a paper um, or something like that, the best way to end a story whenever you don't have anything else to say is to just say, and that's all I have to say about that. Um, but I remember there's this one scene in the movie that has always stuck with me. And it's towards the end of the movie. Forrest is standing over the grave of his deceased wife, Jenny, um, who died young because of just some decisions that she had made in her life. And he's standing there and he says aloud, he says, I don't know who is right, Mama or Lieutenant Dan. Are we all just floating around like a feather on a breeze without a purpose or a plan? Or do we all have a destiny? And man, if I'm honest, there has never been a season in my life where I've felt more like a feather in a breeze tossed in turn um, each and every way than this season. And so in this series, we've been going over the past couple weeks called Better For It. We've just been talking about how we can emerge better for it, where we've been saying, how can our pain be actually a gain? Because pain without gain would be a shame. And so how can we be better because of what we're experiencing? How can we be better because of our circumstances? And so we've been talking over the past three weeks, ways that we can be better for it. And so like the first week, we talked about like what kind of habits would we need to be better for this season? And then we talked about, you know, like our superpower, our response respond ability and how we can choose to respond rather than react in this season. And then last week, Mike talked about how this season has given us some unique opportunities and God has placed some things in our hand that he wants to use in this season. And so today we're actually talking about how we can have a better future. And even talking about a better future, you might be frustrated in that moment. You're like having a better future. Like I can't even think about one day, one week from now, let alone a better future. I mean, I feel like I'm tossed back and forth like a feather on a breeze. Like does God really have a plan for my life? Does God really have a plan for this season? And so today what we're going to do is we're going to kind of like binge watch through the story of a guy named Joseph. And so his story is in Genesis chapter 37. And you got to go like binge watch through it later. I mean, you got to read through it because it is an awesome story. Like basically Joseph's story is if you took this is us, um, Cobra Kai and the crown and put it in a blender, like Joseph's story is what would come out. I mean, this movie has family feuds and fight scenes. It's got royal scandals and people that are way too much to handle. And so we're going to jump right in into episode one of Joseph's story. And episode one is titled Lost because just like plane or just like flight 815, Joseph's story is doomed from the start, except there's no polar bears in his story, but that's just a different thing. You get the idea. And so it starts off in Genesis 37. It says, when Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks, but Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Snitches get stitches. I'm just saying. Um, but it says that Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe, this ornate coat. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. And so one night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about the dream, they hated him more than ever. 
Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in a field tying up bundles of grain and suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and they bowed down before mine. How would you like your sibling to say that? So his brothers responded, so you think you're going to be king over us, do you? Like, dude, you think you're going to reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way that he talked about them. I mean, it's not Joseph's fault that he is his father's favorite, but now he's not only been given special attention and affection from his father, he's walking around sporting his like, dad likes me better than you jacket and flaunting it in front of all of his brothers. I mean, maybe real quick on the chat, let us know if you are an older sibling. We got any older siblings who are tuning in today. And I know you had it way harder than all the younger siblings out there. Um, Younger siblings, if you were a younger sibling, go ahead and tell us in the chat. Um, I am a younger sibling and I'm just saying, it's not our fault that we're our parents' favorite. It's just the way it is. And it's not Joseph's fault either. But you can see why his brothers might not kind of like Joseph. He's got some ego. He's got some arrogance that needs to be worked out inside of him. And it's not a good look on Joseph's part. But the truth is, like, this was a part of God's plan for Joseph. He was saying to this 17-year-old guy, like, I will raise you up not only to a position above your brothers and your family, but above and over all the nations. And so a couple days later, Joseph, um, he gets sent out to bring some supplies to his brothers while they're working. And these brothers have had enough of this arrogant punk. So they devise a plan to beat him up. They steal his dad likes me better than you jacket, throw him into a cistern, this giant pit that they use for a well. And I imagine that as Joseph is lying down on his back, beaten and bloodied, he's laying there thinking, God, this is not a part of your plan. I mean, have you ever had one of those days? One of those weeks? One of those years, one of those seasons where you felt like you were on your back in a pit. And then things get even worse because his brothers eventually decide that they're going to sell him as a slave to Egypt. I mean, talk about your sibling rivalry. And I've got to imagine this. Joseph is being carted off, carried off to Egypt, away from his father, away from his family, away from what he feels like the plan that God had for him. He had to be thinking, God, what happened to your plan? I mean, surely this can't be a part of it. Like either your plan wasn't good or you're not good, God. And maybe lately, man, maybe lately you've been having the same thought. Like, God, this can't be a part of your plan. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to know, God, like if you even have a plan for all this, a plan for my health, a plan for my family, a plan for my job, a plan for my life, a plan for my kids, a plan for my city, a plan for my country, a plan for the government, a plan for the economy, a plan for game stock stock, which I'm just saying, invest while you can. I mean, maybe you're thinking like, God, I had a plan, but you've kind of screwed it all up. I mean, God, I was planning on getting my bachelor's by 22, getting my MRS degree by 25. I was going to be the boss by 30, buy the house by 33, have the kids by 35, and then I was going to be chilling, retired in the Bahamas by 55. But God, you've kind of messed that all up. So either you don't have a plan or your plan's not a good one. So isn't it about time we quit this little sideshow called COVID and we get on with the real plan for my life where I get some purpose back? I mean, God, I feel lost. I feel tired. I'm exhausted. I'm frustrated. I'm hurt. I'm alone. I'm confused. Is this a part of your plan? Like, is my anxiety a part of your plan? Is cancer a part of your plan? Is this depression a part of your plan? Is this pit that I'm stuck in a part of your plan? Uh, One of my friend's name is Doug, and Doug was a police officer in Riverside uh, many years ago. And one day he was first on the scene to a house call when he walked inside the house to hear the cries of a baby echoing throughout the house. And he found out that the neighbor had called the police because the mom had fled the scene after she had tried to mortally or fatally wound her child. And so this neighbor is now standing over a crib, attending to the wounds of this baby. And Doug goes out and he calls an ambulance and walks back in and tries to help make sure the baby is stabilized until the ambulance comes, picks the child up and races him off to the hospital. And my friend Doug walks outside and bangs his fist on the hood of his police car and says, God, you're a jerk and I'm done. Like, is this a part of your plan? I mean, have you ever had one of those moments where it didn't make sense, like God's plan in the midst of your pain? And see, maybe like Doug, maybe like Joseph, your situation and circumstances make you have some questions about God's supposedly good plan for you. And so as we're looking at the story of Joseph, I just want to pull out some principles that we see about God's plan for our lives. And principle number one is this. God does have a plan for our lives, and he has a much better view from above. Do you have any football fans 
watching today. I mean, have you ever noticed that in between the plays, you know, the quarterback will like put his hands on his helmet. And sometimes it's because, you know, he's got his clock rung, you know, or it's because, you know, he's just been tackled so hard. But a lot of times he's got his hand on his head because he's listening to uh, the offensive coordinator talking to him through a speaker in his helmet, calling in the plays because the offensive coordinator will be sitting up in the box office, watching the entire field, watching the entire game take place. And so he can see things that no other coaches, that no other players can see because he can see the whole picture. And while this illustrates the point, honestly, it's a kind of lame attempt to explain how God sees. I mean, how do you explain omniscience? Like you'd have to combine like a box office or an offensive coordinator view with like Superman's x-ray vision with Dr. Phil's knowledge and like Dr. Strange's use of time in order to get a better picture of God's power and the way that he sees things visible and invisible throughout all time. And man, can I add... Like, that's why I trust him so much with my life. Like, he has this incredible view from above where he can see the entire picture like nobody else can. And he's got this love for me that is high and deep and wide and long and this insatiable desire to give me a hope and a future. And so I trust that he knows what he knows and that he can see even when I can't. Uh, Man, in the midst of COVID, one of my uh, friends and a mentor in my life had given me this kind of prayer by a guy named Brendan Manning and just challenged me to pray this um, throughout this season. So man, maybe this week, you just need to try to pray this. It says, may all your expectations be frustrated. May all your plans be thwarted. May all your desires be withered into nothingness so that you may experience the powerlessness and poverty of a child and sing and dance in the love of God who is the Father, Son, and Spirit. Because I'm telling you, God really does have a plan for your life. And it is a better, bigger, greater, grander plan than we can ever even imagine. And he's got a much better view from above. And that leads us to episode two. Episode two is called Gladiator. Have any of you guys ever seen this movie? You know, it follows the story of the general who became a slave, the slave who became a gladiator, and the gladiator who defied an empire. And all throughout the movie, um, there's this great line that the main character says over and over, because even in the midst of his circumstances, he knows who he is, and he has a resolve to continue to live out his identity. He says this, he says, my name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the north, general of the Felix legions, and loyal servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. Amen. Joseph's story, it's the story of a son who became a slave, a slave who will become a prisoner, a prisoner who would eventually define an empire. But first, like he needed to learn who he was. He needed to have a resolve to focus on his identity. And that brings us to principle number two. And that's that God's plan is focused on who more than do. God's plan is always more about who we're becoming than what we're doing. See, in Egypt, Joseph is sold into a governing official named Potiphar's service. And this guy, Potiphar, takes him home and man, he puts Joseph to work. Like this younger sibling, he's no longer the golden child of the family. Like his dreams, the hope and the future that he had, it is not turning out how he expected. But it says in verse two, it says that the Lord was with Joseph and God was interested in using whatever came Joseph's way to mold and shape his character. And there was this obvious arrogance and ego that needed to be worked out in him. And as Joseph worked as a slave in Potiphar's house, man, he learned humility. And as we read and the story goes on, we see that Joseph was faithful. He was obedient. He was this hardworking guy that just did the right thing. He didn't gripe. He didn't complain. He was full of integrity. And in spite of his circumstances, he served, knowing that God was with him and was doing something in him. And as a result, man, God used his life and gave him success in everything he did. Like it says that everything he touched got got success. You know, it's like the theme song of Joseph's life would have been that old magic song. You know, like, I got the magic in me. Every time I touch the track, it turns it into gold. Um, We'll never hear that song again the same. But it says this in Genesis 39. It says, Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph. And because he realized the Lord was with Joseph, Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't even worry about a thing except for what kind of food that he was going to eat. And just like God could use a season of servanthood, to teach Joseph humility, to refine and refocus Joseph's identity, to focus on his character, Man, God could use a season of frustration, a season of uncertainty, a season where you feel like you're blowing around like a feather on a breeze, a season of job loss, a season of singleness, a season like COVID to work on your who, 
Because God cares more about your who than what you do. He cares more about your character than your comfort. And he cares more about who you're becoming than what you're doing. And so who do you want to become? Like, what is the kind of person that you want to become in this season and for the rest of your life? And man, maybe this week you need to read through Joseph's story and write down the kind of character he had and resolve to become that kind of person or flip through the pages of scripture and see what God brings to mind of like who you might want to become. And I want to read you um, an anthem that I kind of heard a couple of years ago. Um, it's called uh, The Fellowship of the Unashamed. And it's just been kind of like an anchor for me of the kind of person that I want to become, of who I want to be. Um, and actually on Monday, we're going to do another Better For It workshop where we're going to talk about not just like who we want to become, but how we actually lay that out in our lives and how we can work towards that over the next 90 days. And so make sure you check that out. It is going to be awesome. You don't want to miss it. Um, But here's kind of the who that I heard a couple years ago that it's like, man, this is who I want to become. It goes like this. It says, I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, positions, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk with patience. I'm uplifted by prayer and labor with power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, Compromised, detoured, lured away, divided, or delayed. And I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. And I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I have stayed up, stored up, and paid up for the cause of Christ. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he returns for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear, for I am not a ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. Okay, it doesn't say that last part. But what I've been learning from looking at the life of Joseph, what God's been teaching me in this season is that God is far more concerned with my character than my comfort. And God's plan for our lives a lot of times looks more like who than do. And until we start thinking that way, we're going to miss God's plan for us because we're going to hold up the canvas of our dreams before God and say that it has to look this way. We have to do all of these things for, in order for it to be the master plan that you have for me. And the life of Joseph says, no, it doesn't. Like God says, I'll use whatever life throws at you to shape you, to mold you, to chisel the character in you, to make you into the person I know that you can be and to lead you where you need to go. You can trust in that. You can trust in the plan. You can trust in the process and you can trust in me. See, what you do can change, but man, who you are, that goes with you wherever you go. And so it's time that we decide who we want to be and we resolve to live a different kind of way and to be a different kind of person. And man, it's a good thing that Joseph's who had gotten some work done on it because then we enter into chapter three in our story, which is called 50 Shades Darker because I'm just saying it's about to get real. It says this, Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. Cougar, I'm just saying. Um, And I don't know why, but whenever I read Joseph's response to Potiphar's uh, wife, it always plays out in my mind, kind of like to the tune of, you know, Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss, because Joseph responds and he says this, I will not sleep with you, Potiphar's wife. I do not wish to cause any strife. I will not kiss your lovely lips. I will not touch your curvy hips. I will not think about your bod. How in the world could I sin against God? I will not sleep with you here or there. I will not sleep with you anywhere. And this totally frustrates Potiphar's wife. And so one day, when no one else is around, When Joseph is working in the house, she grabbed his clothes and demanded that he sleep with her. And so Joseph pulls away, and as he did, his cloak, his robe, his outer garment came off, and he ran from the house. And so Potiphar's wife is left there holding his robe, and she's frustrated. And so she begins to scream and say that Joseph, this slave, had tried to sexually assault her. And when Potiphar comes in, she tells this big, phony, melodramatic story, which makes Potiphar furious. And so he throws Joseph in jail for attempted rape. I mean, have you ever had one of those kind of days when you're just trying to do the right thing? You're just trying to do the honorable thing, and then all of a sudden you find yourself looking through the prison bars of false accusation? And do you know what the script says in the story? 
It says, but the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. He was right there with him. And now I don't know, but maybe God was reminding Joseph like, hey, I have a great plan for your life. I've got a great vision for you. I'm gonna take you somewhere. Who you're gonna become is gonna be used greatly in this next season. I'm gonna do something extraordinary with you. And if I'm Joseph, I'm like, yeah, okay, God, this plan, so good. Really love the way you work. Masterful plan, great work. You know, getting beat up by my brothers and thrown in a pit. Awesome, loved that. Uh, you know, the trip through the desert chained up by these gypsies. Best Uber I've ever taken. You know, that was awesome. Um, you know, being sold as a slave in Potiphar's house, 10 out of 10 would recommend. Um, charges for simply trying to honor or simply trying to honor you. Yeah, this is exactly how I pictured my life turning out, God. I mean, have you ever had one of those moments one of those days, one of those lives. But you know what? Joseph, who knew who he was called to be, who knew that God's plan was who more than do, he resolved to live a different way. And so after a while, the warden made Joseph head over the entire jail. See, in spite of his circumstances, Joseph just decided he was going to bloom where he was planted. And that leads us to the next principle, principle number three, which is that God is always working, or God is always with you, and he's working in the dark. You see, what Joseph could have easily have done was stopped and been like, okay, God, either A, um, I guess you were wrong, B, you changed your mind, C, I did something to tick you off and the plan, you know, I just wasn't a part of it, or D, you must not be real to begin with. But just, Joseph just continually submitted himself to God, and I think I know why, because repeatedly all throughout the text, it says that the Lord was with Joseph. He blessed him greatly as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. The Lord was with him in the midst of Potiphar's wife. The Lord was with him whenever he went to prison. The Lord gave him favor in everything he did. The Lord was with him. And you see, whenever it gets dark, when we're in the darkest moments of our story, God doesn't go to bed. He doesn't go to sleep. He doesn't need rest. He doesn't take naps. Like God doesn't need a double espresso shot in the morning to get up and get going or a Red Bull in the afternoon to keep him chugging along. Like check out what it says in Psalm 121. It says this. It says, indeed, he, God, who watches over Israel, he never tires, he never sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. It reminds us that when our bodies flop in bed tonight because we are exhausted, when we close our eyes to rest, the inexhaustible God will be up all night long working out the details of our promised hope and future. All night long, 24-7, 365, he will be working even in the midst of the darkest times. Uh, Christian Rager uh, spent four years in a dark place, the infamous concentration camp of Dachau. And he was imprisoned there from the Nazis by 1941 to 1945. And his crime was just being a passionate follower of Jesus. And he said that Nietzsche um, said that a man can undergo torture if he knows the why of his life. But here at Dachau, he learned something far greater. He learned to know the who of his life. And he was enough to sustain me then is enough to sustain me still. See, when Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, you know who was with him? God. And he was working out his plan in the background. When he was in Potiphar's house, God wasn't caught off guard by that. When he was falsely accused, arrested, and thrown in prison, God, the plan wasn't derailed. God was with Joseph as the days and years passed, day after day, night after night. The at work in the dark God was working in the background, timing all of the events together until just the right moment. And that leads us to episode four, which is called Inception, because this is like the do 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 moment where the whole thing comes together and God's like, I love it when a plan comes together. Because now that Joseph's hanging out in jail, um, a couple of days later, uh, Pharaoh sends two of his trusted officials down to jail. And we don't know why they were in prison. Uh, maybe, you know, one was a cupbearer, one was a baker. So maybe, you know, one day the baker burnt the bagels or something like that. Maybe the wine guy just accidentally spilled some wine on Pharaoh. Maybe he just had too much starch in his shorts. I don't really know. But now they're in jail with Joseph and they start to have these weird dreams. And Joseph overhears them talking about their dreams. And he says, you know, I know a thing or two about dreams. I've actually had some dreams back before in my life, but they didn't really turn out, but maybe, you know, I can help you with your dreams. And so these guys begin to unpack their dreams with Joseph. And Joseph says, well, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is, Cutbear, um, in three days time, you're going to actually be lifted back up to your position of power. And when that happens, when you're back at the right hand of Pharaoh, man, don't forget me. Now, Baker, 
buddy, got some bad news for you. You are about to be toast because in three days time, your head is going to be lifted off and you'll be impaled on a pole. And sure enough, after three days, exactly what Joseph said was going to happen, happened. And so now the the cupbearer is back right next to Pharaoh and it says that he forgot Joseph. And so put yourself in Joseph's place. It's been 13 years since he received the promise from God. It's been 13 years since God let him in on the plan. Not 13 minutes, not 13 days, not 13 months, 13 years. And so finally, after two years, whenever the cupbearer has been by Pharaoh's side, um, one day Pharaoh has some dreams and nobody in the land can figure out what these dreams mean. And so all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembers like, oh yeah, this guy that I was in prison with, he can interpret dreams. And so he goes and he gets Joseph and brings Joseph before Pharaoh. And Joseph says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, I cannot interpret your dreams, but maybe God can give you the answer you're looking for. And so Pharaoh tells Joseph his dreams and Joseph says, well, Pharaoh, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. The good news is you're going to have seven years of feast all throughout your land. You are going to have so many crops that you're not going to even know what to do with it. The bad news is after the seven years of feast, there will be seven years of famine. And so you need to store up grain now in the years of the feast in order to prepare for the famine. And so Pharaoh looks at Joseph and is like, well, you're no average Joe. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, But he says, who is wiser than Joseph? Like clearly we need to appoint someone to be over this project. And so Pharaoh says, there's no one better than Joseph. And in one day, in one moment, Joseph is moved up from the right-hand man of the warden to the right-hand man of Pharaoh. Nobody in the land was higher in position other than Pharaoh, than Joseph. Joseph is all of a sudden, his plans fulfilled. The dream that he was given comes to fruition. And then wouldn't you know it, lo and behold, after the seven years of feast, the seven years of famine begin to start, just like Joseph predicted, and two years into the famine, you know who came walking through the doors of Egypt looking to get some food? Joseph's brothers. And these band of brothers walk up to Joseph. They don't even know who he is at this moment. And they bow down before him asking for food. And then in the climax moment of the story, like you got to go check it out. You got to go read it. Um, In Genesis chapter 39, it says this. It says, or in Genesis 45, Joseph says this as he's revealing his character, revealing his identity. He says, I am Joseph. He said to his brothers, is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They're like, is he going to hurt us? Is he going to kill us? Is he going to put each of us in our own individual pits? Like what's going to happen? There's done because they realized that Joseph was standing there in front of them. But Joseph says, he says, come over here. So they came closer and he said again, I'm Joseph, your brother whom you sold into Egypt. And later Joseph would say to his brothers, this um, just amazing line. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. And I imagine that God is like, I love it when a plan comes together because God had a plan for Joseph's life. And man, 12 years after my friend Doug banged on the hood of his police car, he was back in Riverside when, and he was heading up a garage sale fundraiser that his church was putting on when some lady contacted him and said, hey, I've got some things I want to donate. And so she sent him an address and Doug drives over to this house and he parks his car when all of a sudden he realized he's parked in front of the house that he had parked in front of 12 years earlier. And then all of a sudden the garage door begins to roll open and Doug looks inside the garage and he sees the crib that he had stood over 12 years before and a woman begins to walk out and tears start to come in her eyes as she walks up to Doug and she says, you know, I've got a bit of a crazy story, but I feel like I need to tell it to you. And Doug says, ma'am, you don't need to tell me your story. And she says, no, I really want to tell you. And he says, no, ma'am, you don't understand. I was a police officer here in Riverside. And so she says, oh, you must have heard my story. And he said, no, ma'am, 12 years ago, I was the first person to show up at this house on the day the call was made. And the woman just began to bawl and pulled Doug inside her house and began to tell him how 12 years ago, she was in the deepest, darkest pit in her entire life. And she made a decision that she would forever regret. And she fled from her family and ended up in prison. And it was there in jail that she met a man named Jesus. And man, two weeks later, my friend Doug met this girl who was a baby 12 years earlier that he had stood over. She walked into his church holding hands with her mother. And man, I imagine God is like, I love it when a plan comes together. See, here's the truth. God isn't finished writing your story. 
Like the God that was with Joseph in the pit is with you in your pit. Like God isn't finished yet. Don't put a period where God has put a comma. Don't count him out. Like the God that was writing Joseph's story is writing your story. And your story isn't over. This season is just a chapter. It's not the end. He hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't bailed on you. He has heard you. And it might seem like he's not involved in your story. But I am telling you, his fingerprints are all over your story. You're not at the end. You're just in the middle. He is closer than you know and preparing you for a future that you cannot see. In your circumstances, they don't define you. They are just a chapter. They're not the story. And we don't know what tomorrow holds, but God does. We don't know what the final picture looks like, but God does. And your suffering and pain don't have to be the wrecking ball that demolish your faith. They can be the cornerstones on which your faith is built. So don't give up. Keep on trusting. Keep on moving forward. Keep having faith because God has a plan for your life. And just decide today who you want to become. And that at work in the dark God will be behind the scenes, moving all things together for his plan so that he can say, I love it when a plan comes together. And man, when we do that, that's whenever our pain becomes our gain and that we will really be better for it. And that's all I have to say about that. So let's pray real quick. Uh, God, we just thank you. God, we thank you for being a God that loves us. God, we thank you that you are the at work in the dark God that is moving all things together for our good, to give us a plan and a hope and a future. And God, I know that some of us, man, we are tired and we are weary and we are frustrated. And so God, I pray that today you would help us to cling to hope. God, I pray that you would help us to hold on to your promises. God, that you would help us to remember that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you. And so, God, I pray and that you would just remind us that you are with us in the midst of our pit. And, God, we love you so much, and we thank you most of all for Jesus, God, and how you saved us for the saving of many lives um, through him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.